So good afternoon. We are not going to talk a lot about pencils today. Uh, I did, however, bring one for each of you at your table. There should be eight pencils at each table. That is a Faber-Castell Grip 2001 pencil right from Nuremberg, Germany, right from the factory that you've just seen. Uh, and that's something for each of you to, uh, to enjoy and, and talk about and share. What we are going to do today is try and connect some dots uh, in a world that is ever-changing and very, very interesting. The symbolism, if you will, of the pencil, I think is really interesting because for many people, especially in this day and age, a, a pencil is a relatively mundane, ordinary, irrelevant, dated object. And that's not the way we look at it at Faber-Castell. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that and why as we go through. The underlining and the foundation of what we're going to talk about today is the fact that the world that we live in today, the world that we live in, the world that we do business in, the world that we learn in, can largely be described as a world of VUCA. And many of you are familiar with the term VUCA. The origins of the term VUCA actually date back to the post-Cold War period. And that was the term, VUCA, that was used to describe that particular period of time in the world. And if you think about this, and you look at the description of volatility, uncertainty, complication, and ambiguity, there's a lot of relevance to the world that we live in today and a lot of relevance into the world in which we're doing business today. So that will be the foundation of our talk today 
and we'll keep coming back to this idea of living and operating in a VUCA world. So first, we need a roadmap. So over the next little while, I'm going to talk to you first about myself, who is this guy, lessons from a pandemic, just sharing some things with you that we observed and importantly, we learned as a company and as leaders during the pandemic, supply chain, which is very different than a supply link, the big four, and we'll wrap up with some questions and answers. If this resembles a Jeopardy board, then it's not accidental. These could be Jeopardy topics as well. So first of all, this is the first of three dated references this afternoon. Some of you, before there was Star Wars, there was Star Trek. And Dr. McCoy would consistently remind Captain Kirk of what his limitations were, what he was and what he was not. So I will share that with you today. I am a CEO who has the honor and the privilege of leading a team of people in the United States under the Faber-Castell name, reporting into the 260-year-old company in Germany of Faber-Castell. I did not write a book that I'm selling you today. I am not a social scientist. I am not a professional speaker. I am not a market researcher. I am just someone who is so privileged to come and spend time with you today and talk about at least what I'm seeing from my vantage point and my perspective going on in our business and in some ways what's going on in our world. So as I mentioned, I began with Faber-Castell about 19 years ago. The Faber-Castell company, as was mentioned, was founded in 1761. It's the oldest company of all the pencil companies in the world. We do about 2.3 billion pencils per year still. We do about 700 now, 700 million euro in volume worldwide. You can see we have quite a number of employees. We have always, always, always been family owned. And we are now on generation number nine, over 260 years of family ownership. We have production sites in nine different countries and sales offices in 23 countries. We are branded and marketed in 120 countries. And we have a lot of different products that we do. So that's a little bit about our company. This is our campus outside of Nuremberg in Bavaria, Germany. It's a very traditional campus with a production facility that does the pencils and the video that you just watched comes from this campus in Bavaria. We also have a castle. And on our campus, we have a castle, which was the residence of the family for many, many years. It then became a residence for media and is now used for a variety of different events that we have uh, over in Germany. What drew me to Faber-Castell was this man. This is Count Anton Wolfgang von Faber-Castell. And because of the type of guy that he was before his passing in January of 2016, because of the type of guy he was, he insisted that you take that long name and that long title and you just call him Count Tony. <laughs> this was Count Tony. The remarkable thing about Count Tony for me that I will always remember is whenever he was asked about the digital age, the way things were changing, and Count Tony, you're a pencil company, you're a pencil guy, the world is changing, the world is moving, everything is digital, don't you feel threatened? And Tony would always say, you're only threatened if what you are is a pencil company. And he never viewed our company as a pencil company. Pencils were what we made, but a pencil company is not what we were. Because we were always a company that believed in quality, brand, and creativity. It just so happened that the pencil was one of our marquee products that we used to do that. I also worked 
for another family-owned, privately held European company called Lego. And when I worked for Lego, that was back in the 1980s, and it was at a time where not many people really knew who we were. And myself and a group of many others went through the grassroots building process of bringing Lego into the US market and building that brand with the patience and the tolerance and the focus of the Danish ownership that we had at the time. I think many of you now, and certainly those that you have as family members and those in, in the public in general, are very, very familiar with Lego. And let me just tell you something about Lego. If you believe that the product and the brand and what Lego stands for is truly outstanding, and it is, I can tell you that the people and the family and the culture is every bit of that and more, and I think the two are related. It's a tremendous company with a tremendous brand that starts with a tremendous culture and a real commitment to kids and play and quality on the part of the family. And once again, it was a true privilege to, to work with Lego. So my path was obviously Faber-Castell and Lego. We all have our own path. We all get to where we are and where we're going in different ways. For me, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I went to Notre Dame. I went from Notre Dame to Lego. I then worked with uh, Playmobil and with Faber-Castell. I lived in Toronto for a while. So I had a whole lot of different experiences that really make me who I am today. And I'm sure it's the same for all of you. We all have our own journey. We all have our own path that forms our decision making and forms the, the people that we are today. What we all have in common, however, is that over the past two and a half years, we've shared the experience of living through a pandemic. And that was something that was very formative for us as a company. It was something that obviously we had never lived through and never expected as a company. And it was truly formative. In a way, and almost feeling a little bit sheepish and a little bit guilty, during the pandemic, we registered record sales. And if you think about the type of a product we are, and if you think about how people spent their time because there were other ways they could not spend their time, it was the perfect situation for us and our creative products. People were spending more time sketching, drawing, coloring, creating. And during that time, our sales were booming. Not so much our profit, because at the same time, demand was at a record high. Costs were also dramatically increasing, and certainly that's what we continue to see today. Sales were strong. Profit was decent. But coming out of that pandemic, there was something that's more lasting that we learned more so than sales and profit. And to me, I believe that in our business and myself as a leader, I think there were four lessons that came from the pandemic. The first is that our why, and those of you who are familiar with Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek is really the, the father of our why. And our why is really simply the reason that you're in business anyway. If you wake up in the morning and say, why am I doing this anyway? Why does this company exist? What is our purpose? That is really our why. For, for us as a company during the pandemic, our why came to life, and it sustained us, and it kept us together. Our why at Faber-Castell is the belief that we, as a company, 
that can enrich people's lives. We truly believe that we can enrich people's lives and that we can do that through creativity and self-expression. And I'm not just talking about kids. I'm talking about children. During the pandemic, I'm talking about parents, parents who were put in a position to be both teachers and parents at the same time. We helped enrich their lives. People who had fallen away from being creative and wanted to get creative again, we enriched their lives. And each and every day, we continue to enrich the lives of people who struggle, those who have PTSD, post-war vets, seniors, many, many people. And our team in Cleveland truly believes that we can enrich people's lives in this way. What's truly interesting is that during the pandemic, this why, which we have printed on t-shirts and we have it on posters and we have it in PowerPoint presentations, we have it on coffee mugs, that why truly came to life because our employees could see true evidence that we were making a difference, that they were making a difference in people's lives. And that enrichment was really taking place. The other lesson that we learned was that health was properly defined eventually. Early in the pandemic, it was very quantitative. It was very black and white. Health was, did you test positive or negative? That was our definition of health. And we quickly and eventually came to learn that health is holistic. We were seeing our employees struggle. We were seeing people in families struggling and having a difficult time. Whether they were testing positive or negative, it didn't matter. So we really gained a new appreciation for health in the way that it should really be defined in terms of physical and the mental health and well-being of our employees. And we carry that with us now. We also learned, after a while, that we are wired for human connection. Events like this today, us getting together in this room, welcoming new guests, welcoming new members, meeting new people, we're wired for human connection. We missed that as a company. Probably no, nobody more than our salespeople. Our salespeople were making sales calls on Zoom, on Teams, on screens. They missed that. Trade shows. We didn't go to trade shows for two and a half years. We were missing that contact, missing that connection. And today, in a hybrid work environment, in our office, when you see someone in the hall and they say to somebody, how are you doing? How's it going? It's not quite as rhetorical as it used to be. There's a little more substance to it. And then lastly, of the four lessons, I would suggest to you that what we learned as a company was that sometimes you just need to take action. In a few minutes, we'll talk about certainty and uncertainty, but sometimes you just need to take action. There is no way that a company that is owned by a German parent was ever going to let anybody work from home. That was never going to happen. <laughs> work from home. Are you kidding me? We were never going to get there. But we had to. And the beautiful thing is that when we did, we found that people worked hard. They were productive. We had to take that step. We would never, ever ship directly to a consumer's house. We shipped big quantities on pallets in trucks to distribution centers. We don't do this one-off little stuff of drop shipping orders to someone's house. Well, during a pandemic, that's what you do. And now we do it, and it's part of our business, and we can do it profitably, and we learn. Sometimes, you just got to take action. And as we'll see in a minute, you can't always be certain about it. So when we look at the pandemic, 
These are the four things that we learned. I'm sure you have learnings from your life and from your businesses, but these are four of the really important things that we learned, and we carry those with us. So the good thing is the pandemic was the pandemic, so hey, good news, that's past us, right? Not so fast. <laughs> so now as we start to work our way through the pandemic, there's this other thing that starts to take place around the early part, spring, summer of 2021, and we see these images. Starting in late August or September a year ago, no matter where you looked, there was that image of the containers in the port of Los Angeles sitting there. We saw it over and over and over again. And all the containers in the ports, we saw that image over and over again. And that was called supply chain. But the real truth of it is, it's a supply chain, not a supply link. So it's not just about containers sitting in the middle of a port. It is everything from the manufacturing to the store shelf or the Amazon warehouse. It's all supply chain. And as what we've come to learn, it's about the transportation. It's about truckers. It's about labor. It's about all of these things. The chain is a chain. The chain is not a link. So when we look at last year, 2021, we saw everything from labor and restrictions issues at the factory, so at the very, very beginning of the chain. And then we couldn't get vessels to sail and containers to sail to bring it into port. And when we did, yes, there was port congestion. And then when it got to the port, we couldn't get it transported because there was nobody to drive the trucks there. And then when we got it to our distribution center, we couldn't get labor to unload the trucks. And then when we finally got it to the store, there was nobody in the store to load the shelves. So time and time again, and oh, by the way, the cost of a container, and when I talk about a container, it's a shipping container. The cost of a shipping container in 2019 was $4,000 per container. Earlier this year, we'd paid $20,000 to ship that same container into the US, five times, five times the cost. So this was a major, major issue for us. So now we fast forward into this year, 2022. Kind of interesting. On the West Coast, if you go to the Port of LA right now, congestion is easing. If you go to the East Coast, congestion is rising. Simple reason. People were looking to avoid the West Coast. They say, I'm gonna ship it to the East Coast. Everybody ships it to the East Coast. What do we have? Congestion on the East Coast, easing on the West Coast. Simple. Last year, when costs were rising, everybody looked to lock in with a contract rate on their shipping. They locked in at high rates. Now what do we begin to see? Now we see that shipping costs are coming down. Now everybody's moving to the spot market to try and get spot rates, but they're locked into these contracts. What do you do? Changed quickly. Transportation labor is still tight. It is still difficult. Rail transportation, truck transportation, getting it into our building, getting out of our building. Transport labor is still tight. Sailing times are improving. We can get a container faster now than we could a year ago. And those container costs that were $20,000, those are now down to $16,000. So if you look at this description, if you take 2021, what was happening in 2021? You look at 2022, what's happening here? Things are improving. Things are getting better. I think, I think we've got it made. Not so fast. Because <laughs> now what's happening? Maybe part of the reason that this is easing up a little bit is guess what's happening? Demand, especially for discretionary goods, is flattening out. Demand is declining. Retailers, I, I see it every week now. So this morning, Kohl's, customer of ours, yeah, that order that we were gonna take in August, I, I think we're gonna push that to October. Amazon, push it back. Target, push it back. 
Michaels, Hobby Lobby, Joann's, pushing it back. All these commitments, all these orders that they had placed with us for shipment in August and September, pushing it back. We're seeing right now that this inventory that is now not being shipped out because they're pushing the order back, this inventory is arising fat, it's arriving faster, and it's piling up. So now all the inventory that we needed is coming in, it's coming in faster, it's coming in full, and it's not going away as quickly. So what that means is it's putting a tremendous amount of pressure domestically on the domestic supply chain distribution centers, anybody who's importing, all of those things, tremendous pressure in that area. Storage charges are rising, miscellaneous charges are rising, and very, very importantly and critically, I can tell you the cash flow is becoming absolutely strained because we're paying for this inventory and we're not shipping it out. So we'll get paid for that inventory after we ship it but we'll pay for the inventory as we receive it, and it's a tremendous pressure on cash flow. And lastly in this area, the negotiations are taking place right now between the unions and the ports about a new agreement. And the simple story here is, as you would imagine, the unions have watched the carriers make a tremendous amount of money over the past two and three years, and they want their piece of the pie. They want wage increases. They want their piece of the financial pie. The ports are saying, we can't have this congestion again. We need to automate. We need to drive more productivity at the ports. And we need to have automation. And the union says, automation is nothing but a code word for cutting jobs. And this is the negotiation that's taking place right now between the unions and labor. And that will go on on the West Coast probably for the next 30 days or so. So this is what we're looking at in terms of the real supply chain situation. And it's changing on a regular basis. And the key change right now is the shift in the flattening of demand. And that's backing all of this up even as things improve. So. The picture is supply chain, pandemic, inflation, hybrid work environment, inventory backing up. We've got all these different things that we're trying to deal with. In many ways, we're looking at these one by one by one, piece by piece by piece. But the real key to this and where we start to connect the dots is that any of these and all of these are all about change. So we do need to address each and every one of those. But what we really need to do is find a way within our companies, within our organizations, within our lives, to find a way to deal with change. And we need to do that in a VUCA environment. And that's what makes things so complicated. It's change, it's speed, it's volatility, uncertainty, complication, and ambiguity. And that's the world that we have the privilege of living in and operating in today. For us as a business, we are right now in the midst of a five-year strategic plan. Think about this. <laughs> in, in this period, we're going to project and forecast five years from now. It, it's laughable after what we've been through the past couple, three years. But to do that, we have broken our business down into seven strategic building blocks. Very simple, very basic. Every business has their own version of this. I, I don't claim this to be something that's uh, absolutely groundbreaking. Everybody's got their version. Our seven building blocks have to do with brand and innovation, supply chain, certainly, sales and distribution channels, new business that we have to generate, people and culture, sustainability, which is increasingly important, and internal digitization. 
So this is what we need to deal with in terms of our building blocks. And this is the, these are the building blocks that our strategy and our plan will be built upon. And all of that is super important and it's really hard work, but it's so, so necessary. But I don't really think that's the only important thing. I, I don't think that if this is what we do, and if this is where we spend our time, and if this is where we dedicate our energy, I don't think that's going to cut it. Because what I also think we need to spend time with are what I call the big four. And the big four are culture, clarity, creativity, and kunsukuroi. And if you don't understand that last term, then it's something that I didn't either until about three years ago. But I'm excited to share that with those of you who aren't familiar with it, because I think it's genius. All right, let's start with culture. So we learned it during the pandemic. We know it. Culture is so critically important. What is the culture within the company? What is that environment? What are the values? What do we believe in? How do we behave? What guides us within the company? And to me, open-mindedness and trusting are two critical parts of the culture that we need to create in order to win. So let, let me say that for, for a second, because I think this is so important when we talk about these things. Oftentimes, we'll talk about things like culture. And as I like to say, and we all remember this experience, so if you go back when you were a kid and you would have a family gathering at Thanksgiving, I, I, ours was always at Thanksgiving. So we would have this big family gathering at Thanksgiving and all the relatives would be there and all the cousins and everybody would, would be there. And the kids would sit at the kids' table. So you were at the kids' table. All the important stuff was going on at the grown-ups table, and you were at the kids' table. Not that you would want to be at that other table, but you were at the kids' table. It's kind of the way we think about these things. When we talk about things like culture, oftentimes in business, we know we have to mention it. We know we kind of have to talk about it. But it sits at the kids' table, not at the boardroom table. And more and more, what I'm suggesting is that these things, they, they need to join the boardroom table. They don't need to sit at the kids' table any longer. And I think that's part of this with culture. So open-mindedness, trusting environments of culture will drive business. It's part of the business strategy. So quick aside, if you have 19 minutes of your life to spare, Watch and listen to the YouTube video by Sir Ken Robinson that's called The Future of Education. Maybe some of you have seen it. Up until recently, it was the most viewed YouTube video ever. It's 19 minutes. It's entertaining. It's, it's humorous. It's insightful. Sir Ken Robinson. Sir Ken Robinson, in this talk, that he gives says, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. And I think in this day and age where we talk so much about innovation, that's a really, really important notion. If that doesn't work for you, maybe this does. So this is our second dated reference of the afternoon. Frank Zappa said, by the way, I, I gave a talk at um, Georgetown earlier this year. And I used this slide. No clue. <laughs> no idea. They didn't know if it was my neighbor. They didn't know if it was my uncle. No idea. So that's why I'm glad to be with you today. But Frank Zappa said, a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. Our minds need to be open, and that's part of the culture that we have to, we have to forge. And then we talk about trust. 
and, and trust is a, a critically important part of this. And, and let me just explain to you why. So I, I'm going to pick on my good friend and Bollinger because I, because I trust her and I know she'll let me pick on her. So Anne and I are working on a project. And the project that we're working on requires us to both innovate and problem solve. And we're collaborating on this toward a solution and an idea. What Ann and I need to be able to do is we need to be able to openly share crazy ideas, stupid thoughts, things we're not even remotely sure of, and we need to be able to be wrong and silly and stupid. Because if we're not, we're not going to be our most creative selves. We're not going to be great problem solvers. We're not going to be great ideators. The only way Ann and I can do that is if we trust each other. I am not going to throw a silly idea out there that could be brilliant if I think Ann is going to judge me or criticize me or make me feel stupid. And that same example of that relationship between Ann and I is what we need to foster within our companies. We need to foster trust. And when we think of, think of people that you trust, think of people that you respect, think of people that you work really well with together, oftentimes they are credible, they are reliable, they are authentic. And they sure as heck are not divas and people who think about only their self-interest. So this is trust expressed in kind of an equation. We want to maximize credibility and reliability and authenticity, and we want to minimize self-interest. And that's going to give us the trust that we need to work together and collaborate. Clarity, the next of the big four. But it's clarity without certainty. We need to be clear, even though we can't be certain. And we need to, what I call, thrive in the gray. All right, here's another quick story for you. So I'm getting ready for this talk, and I can't come up with the words. And I want to say, uh, live in the gray, or learn to live in the gray. So I Google it. So I Google live in the gray. It's all about interior decorating. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's a lot of gray going on out in the home decor world. So didn't help me at all. So either I'm the only one thinking about this, or I was just using the wrong terms. But I do think it's really important that we be able to not just live, but in fact thrive in the gray. And I've not researched this. I don't know for a fact, but somehow, I ask myself if the impact of technology has hindered our ability to thrive in the gray. OK, why do I say that? I say that because we can get an answer to almost anything we want rather instantaneously. We can get it fast. We can get it definitive. Our desire. And in fact, our capability for black and white and fast and definitive has increased so much that I don't know if that has impacted our ability to thrive in the gray. But I think we need to be able to do that. We also know, in terms of clarity, that leaders are right now, on a regular basis, being asked to both perform and transform. So it's not a matter of either or anymore. It's a both and and world. In an environment like that, we need to be clear with our leaders. So what we're doing at Faber-Castell is we're trying to be really clear about the behaviors that we want from our leaders. And those behaviors are an entrepreneurial mindset we want our leaders to be inspirational. We want them to be resilient. And we've had a tremendous amount of practice and resiliency in the last couple of years. 
We want them to be authentic, and we want them to be fully committed to developing people. Each of these essentials are supported by a list of behaviors. And that's our way of trying to be as clear as we can possibly be about something that in many ways is uncertain, in many ways is ambiguous. Third of the big four, creativity. And artists don't necessarily need to apply. And I'll explain to you why. Every day we talk about innovation. You've probably spoken about innovation three times today. Innovation is the only way to win. You see quotes about this all the time. Without creativity and imagination, there is no innovation. And, and that's a fact. We will not innovate unless we ideate and we're creative. 1,500 CEOs proclaimed in a survey, creativity is the number one trait needed for success in business. World Economic Forum, top 10 skills to drive economic development in 2025, heavily concentrated on creative problem solving and creativity. Mitchell Resnick from the MIT Media Lab says, in a fast changing world like today, people are confronted with a never ending stream of the unknown, the unexpected, and the unpredictable. The ability to think and act creatively is now more important than before. Very clear. Creativity is super, super important, but there's a problem. And this is the problem. Creativity can be and is measured on a regular basis. Creativity peaks at age five. So how many of you in the last couple of weeks have spent any time with a five-year-old? <laughs> Astounding. <laughs> Astounding. Creativity peaks at age five. And you can see where it goes at age 31. I think for a lot of us, if we extended this out, you would see it rise again later. But at 31, we're at an all-time low. And that was 280,000 surveyed. Maybe the most disturbing part of this is what happens between age 5 and age 10. Because where are these children between age 5 and age 10? And then where are they going at age 15? So to me, when we talk about creativity, and this was a slide that I, I used at, at a talk I gave on this, is we need creative help. But you don't need to be an artist. Artists need not apply. Because if this is your artistic limit, come on. I didn't, I didn't put those pencils on the table for nothing. If this is your artistic limit, I have got great news for you. You are still in the game of creativity. Because it has very little to do with your artistic capabilities. What it has a lot to do with is Divergent thinking, a filter, and convergent thinking. We need to discover, brainstorm, ideate. But very importantly, we also need to define and we need to decide. So when we think of creativity, in the words of Sir Ken Robinson, our friend from the YouTube video, creativity is the process of having original ideas. We all know that. But what's really, really important is it doesn't stop there. Because once you have those original ideas, I'm sorry to tell you, but they have to have value. So if we're really going to be generating creativity, we love the brainstorming. We love the ideation. We love all those wacky and crazy ideas. But we then have to decide. And those decisions and those ideas have to have value, because that's how we get from the bridge from ideation to innovation. And that mindset that we're looking for has a lot of different attributes to it, adding to a creativity mindset. So this is not a class. It's not a course. You don't need to take notes. But 
I think this is so important. So this is what's known as the four C's of education. And I would say it's not just the four C's of education. I would say it's the four C's of learning. I think it's the four C's of development. I think it could be the four C's of management. It's the four C's of organizational development. And it's all about, can we communicate? Are we critical thinkers? Can we collaborate? And can we be creative? And this is really where, in a world of STEM, which is fantastic and, and super important and, and critical and really, really important, STEM, and startups and technology, in, in that world, we absolutely need to be fostering this and developing the four C's. We need people who communicate, collaborate, critical think, and are creative. We absolutely do. And this is kind of why. So 65% of today's students will be employed in jobs that do not exist yet. So take a middle schooler. You got a kid in middle school right now. By the time they go to be employed, two thirds of them will be employed in jobs that don't even exist yet. 85% of the jobs that exist in 2030 and beyond haven't even been thought of yet. And 40% of today's jobs will be gone. So the question becomes, how in the world are we vocationally training and doing technical training alone if this is what we're training for? And again, as I said, we are in a both and world. It is not either or. So it is not either the four C's or technical and vocational training. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is, we need both. It is both and. And this is the type of world that we need to be preparing for. And that is, once again, if that's not VUCA, I'm not sure what is. OK, last one. And then we're going to wrap up here. So about three years ago, I uh, had breakfast with a really good friend of mine who is the head of pediatric surgery at Rainbow Babies Hospital in Cleveland. Uh, and I had a, a breakfast with him. We were talking. And he introduced me to this idea of Kinsukuroi, which is really, in essence, better from being broken. Here's what it is. So in Japan, there is a concept where precious artifacts that become damaged or broken get repaired but they don't just fix them. They take the cracks and crevices and imperfections from having been broken, and they repair it with gold. And in so doing, that object or that artifact is more beautiful, it's more valuable, it's more precious than it was in its original state. So what if we, as organizations, as companies, as communities, what if we took that approach to imperfection, failure, errors, mistakes, and we filled those with whatever our version of gold is? Whatever your version of gold is, Fill that mistake with that gold and make it better, stronger, more valuable, more precious than it even was in its original state. So from a corporation standpoint, from a CEO standpoint, from a leader standpoint, if I can ever wrap my mind around behaving this way and treating errors and mistakes like this, and believe me, this is not about, hey, anything goes. Doesn't matter. Make a mistake. We don't care. It doesn't matter. That is not this. This is about taking those imperfections, filling it with gold, and making it more valuable than it was before. And as it says here, it's more beautiful for having been broken. It's stronger. It's better because it was broken, not in spite of. So we look at our big four. 
culture, clarity, clarity without certainty. We're living in a VUCA world. It's not going to be certain, but we got to get clear. Creativity, creativity because we need to innovate, but we also need to problem solve. And kids are curioi, how can we look at things that are imperfect? So that's, that's it. I would just say to you, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you to Anne for inviting me. Uh, it's great to see all of you. And if there are any questions, comments, discussion, um, do we have time for that? We have time for a couple of questions. OK. Then I, I'll, uh, I'll follow your lead, Kathleen. Questions? Jan. You talked about the creativity oh, and the human connection. How are those going to come together with people working at home and being cut off from their peers? Simply stated, I don't know that it will. I, and, and I'll be honest with you. I, I have not found, <clears throat> I haven't found the virtual screen driven program meeting convention, gathering, team building that does it to the degree that we do it in a hybrid work environment. We were remote for the better part of two and a half years at Faber-Castell USA. We are now hybrid, and we do that because we, ex we respect the flexibility, we respect the productivity, but back to culture and fostering creativity and the human connection, we, we know there are times when we need to be together. So I, I wish I had an answer for you. I wish I could be more optimistic about how we can go strictly remote and strictly virtual, and we can get this done, and we can maximize these things. Again, no, I'm not a social scientist. I, I, I just don't see it, and that's why we made the decision that we made for our company. Great question. Maybe somebody else has a solution. I don't, but great question. Jamie? Yes. Uh, the sign over there says we're an economic club, and uh, as econom economists and the like, we're taught to believe in supply and demand and to think that they're going to rectify things when they get out of kilter. I want to go back to your supply chain idea. Uh, I think it was three months, maybe four months ago, you told me you thought the supply chain would start to smooth out in August, and maybe it would take until the fall until it was essentially corrected. Today, it sounds like it's a more complicated situation than maybe what you had in mind at that time. When do you see us getting back to a point where these things are all relatively smooth and the supply chain is functioning nicely? The, mid the middle of 2023. So just to be, and, and, and you know, not to pretend like I'm you know, precise and I can give you the day, but um, it will be the middle of next year. Let me tell you why. Because I think what's going to happen is the, the demand shift that we're seeing right now, that will moderate and that will find its level. Uh, I think right now, and this is difficult for us because right now we're trying to project, think about this, we're trying to project the holiday shopping season right now. And in fact, we're too late anyway because we own the inventory, but we're trying to project it right now. I, it, it's shifting. We, we don't know what's going to happen with discretionary spending. What we do believe is all the labor, uh, contract negotiations, all of those things, that will be worked out and that will be in place in the spring to early summer of 2023. We believe demand will also then settle down and we will find a new level and a new reality in the late spring to summer of 2023. We think that's gonna be true from, it'll be a more, again, we're still operating in VUCA, it'll be more predictable, more stable from a, an inflationary standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint, from a demand standpoint. And I think we will hit that new level, notwithstanding we've seen it. Things can happen. But I do think, Ken, yeah, that, that's, that's what we're looking at at least is that this will be, could it happen sooner? Maybe, but if it happens sooner, it's probably not gonna be good news. But I think it'll be you know, spring, summer of 2023. That's just our perspective but really important. Two more questions. Yep. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question kind of piggybacks that one in the sense that as a German company, I was wondering if there's been a focus on the disruption to your productive capability domestically uh, given the 
what is likely to be a uh, lack of power source uh, going into the winter and next year uh, as Russia kind of turns the screws off domestically? Is your company focusing on uh, more production in the United States and some of your other uh, facilities to kind of offset that because that could put a serious constraint on your ability to meet demand? Great, great question and great example of connecting the dots um, for what's going on out there. So first I can tell you that the, the only production we have in the United States right now is we have a cosmetics division that's located in Elgin, Illinois. So we do have US production there and I know that they're moving more production to Elgin. So that's on the cosmetic side. For the rest of the business, we're fortunate enough to have nine different factories around the world. More of that production, where capable, is moving outside of Germany. So for instance, we have a huge color pencil factory in Brazil. Uh, it's part of a reforestation operation where we are reforesting and using all of our own wood. So a lot of that German production is ready to move, some of it, to Brazil. We also have Malaysia and Indonesia. So those are areas that we can tap into. Unfortunately, there are certain products, like our highest end color pencil, we only make that in Germany. So that is one that will probably suffer because we have one place that we can make that. But really, really good question. And I was talking with, uh, with Jeff this morning about some of the issues right now uh, over in Germany as it relates to energy and resources and what they're doing about it. So very pertinent question. So thank you very much for your, uh, uh, for your presentation. I have to say that your talk about uh, creativity is like one of the reasons, I just realized the, re the reason why I left a stable job to follow someone in a startup company was their creativity, their huge mindset. My question though is, as an economist, everyone in the room, we're talking about the labor shortage that's going on right now. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on are, like where did people, everyone go? And <laughs> right. I mean, th there's a talk about the <clears throat> pandemic that people are adjusting their lifestyles to, you know, they want to do things with better pay, not as hard work. I just was curious as a CEO for, a, uh, for your company, where, what's your view on where did everyone go? I, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know where everyone went. <laughs> I, I can tell you, though, what's really interesting for us, especially in our distribution center, so it's where we're shipping things out, um, it, it, it was a very complicated situation. We could not get people. And next door to our facility in Cleveland is a brand new Amazon distribution center. So. Amazon, remember, Amazon is a customer of ours. We went to Amazon and said, we need to take a price increase. We're, we're taking a price increase. We can't, we can't avoid it. So we went to Amazon with a price increase. Amazon said to us, no way. We're not taking a price increase. Sorry, we're not accepting it. At the same time, they opened up a distribution center next door to us. We're paying our employees $16 an hour. Amazon rolls into town, pays 22. So what we need, what we need to do is we want to keep these people. So we raise our 16 to 18 to 19 to 20. Our costs go up. They won't accept a price increase. So they got you coming and they got you going. <laughs> so just a really, really interesting and complicated thing for us to work our way through, which eventually we did. But I, to answer your core question, I don't know where the labor force went. We do see them starting to come back now. Maybe they were all on vacation and now they're coming back, I don't know. But we're starting to see them come back now. But at the same time, they're coming back now because things are starting to soften. Demand is starting to weaken. So they're, they're, it is happening that way. So I mean, again, maybe, maybe there's other people in this room who have tracked it or traced it and know where, where they went. I think it's a great question, and I don't have a specific answer for it. Thanks. Ron. Ron, one more. Uh, Lego. Yes. Low-tech toy, uh, pretty appealing to a pretty wide age group. How do you explain, and, and for a long time, how do you explain its uh, appeal and success, and especially in relation to that five-year-old to 10-year-old creativity dropping? So my belief is that there is 
the need for balance and equilibrium between technology and core traditional play. Lego is beautiful in its simplicity. It added licensing, so now you've got a little bit of a story and entertainment element to it. And don't underestimate that you've got a generation of parents and grandparents and relatives who grew up with Lego, who are so much more comfortable with that type of play than they are with some other types of tech play, if you will. Again, not one or the other, it's both. And I think that's what Lego has been able to leverage was that heritage and that generation of users and loyalists and fans that are now having kids, grandkids, relatives, and they're able to build that franchise in that manner. So I, I think that's, that's what it is in a way that others probably haven't. Others don't have that same franchise or, or don't have that same feeling for the product. Um, amazing franchise, amazing product, though. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.